Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, what's happening there? Um, uh, okay, so I think probably what's happening there is this: these kinds of flames are a little bit goofy because they're they're not symmetric. So you actually can get some. I'm, I'm speculating here. I, th I think what's I'd have to dig into this a little bit more. What's happening with these kinds of flames is is that you. Um, when you have these non-symmetric configurations where you're stagnating reactants into products, a typical temperature profile might look like this. You know, where this would be that one temperature and that. So you're actually losing heat on the backside. Um, but the other thing that's happening is, is if you think about some critical um, versus, versus a, a symmetric configuration, you know, would look like that. And so there's no the center line is, is adiabatic. But what also happens is if you were to plot something like a, um, an H radical or something like that, you know, that would also look like this. And you're basically losing, losing these um, critical radicals to, to the product side. And I'm guessing that's probably what's happening there. I'd, I'd have to, we, you'd have to actually dig into what the different species profiles are. But uh, it's because of that, the fact that it's not it's not symmetric and you're losing stuff to the products. Second quick question. Um, you, you mentioned that there's this critical downpour number below which there's, a, there's still a triple point where we're not advancing an edge. And then you said, but the density ratio can also help you advance the edge. And so does that, does that ever move that critical downpour number to below the? Yeah, so remember, um, when I talked about density ratio, this particular scaling applies to very, very high. This, this density ratio, this is a non-premixed situation at high Domco numbers where you have the triple flame structure. So the reason for this scaling is very much a function of the fact that you have this structure and you basically get this curved front which gives you this divergence. I don't know what would happen um, when you lose the triple flame, but I feel pretty confident that you would lose this scaling. That answer your question? Yes. Okay. I apologize. I'm supposed to repeat the questions and I forgot. Um, I'll try to remember. Help me remember to repeat questions. Anyone else have a question? All right. Okay. So just a couple things. Just I have here. I'm going to have to start moving a little bit quicker because I I took too long. I've been too long winded here. Um, I haven't talked much about heat loss effects, but the one place, and oftentimes heat loss effects in high velocity, high dom clone number flows are generally not that important um, because aerodynamic loss, uh, strain effects are generally much more important. With that, with that caveat, um, heat loss effects, heat losses are very, very important to understand flame stabilization because the flame is stabilized, shear layer stabilized flames are stabilized right in the vicinity of hot metal. And so they're they're not only edge flames, but they're also highly non-adiabatic flames. Um, simple example is you can, you can take a, uh, uh, well, let's go to this picture that I drew here. You can, you know, if you do a controlled experiment where you can change the edge, the, the temperature of the, the metal, you could really, really significantly change blowout limits. And what that's telling you is, is that there's a lot of heat interact communication between this flame edge and that hot wall. So that's, so that's why it's important to think about heat loss effects even in very high dom Kohler number um, situations for, for edge flames. And so what heat losses can do is they can actually cause negative edge speeds or basically extinction even in high dom Kohler numbers. And that, that, I don't think that would be surprising to any of you. Um, but it's just 
it's borne out. And here's some data. This again is data from, from Paul Ronnie. Uh, you know, these are Dom, this is a, a data for non premix flame, Dom colon numbers, heat losses, and just showing you that, you know, uh, you get too much heat loss, you go from an advancing front to a retreating front or a global extinction. Um, Let's see. Now, I want to dig into this fact. I want to talk about this, this fact that um, within this hysteresis zone, there is a region where, edge, where flames can be propagating or retreating fronts. And I, I want to just kind of walk through. Let's, let's do a, a thought problem here. And let's assume that I have a, a strain profile that looks like this. This is some spatial coordinate. This is, some, this is the stretch rate. And let's assume that the stretch profile, you know, so, again, thought experiment so I can do whatever I want. You know, I can magically impose at time t equals zero this stretch profile. All right? And um, kappa extinction denotes the extinction stretch rate. So we know that if the stretch rate exceeds kappa extinction, the flame goes away, right? But we also know, let me just back up a few slides that this would correspond basically to that, although it's not in the same terms, this would sort of correspond to cap extinction value, you know, if I was plotting. But we also know that there's a range of values that once you have a flame edge, if you had a, if you had a kappa value within this range, once you create an edge, that edge will, will um, continue to grow, right? So, What happens is, is that, again, at time t equals zero, I have this strain profile. So it's, I'm going to have a hole. The flame is will extinguish at points where the, ex, the stretch rate is greater than extinction stretch rate. But what that also means is that if I come back to this picture, that hole will not just be over this region here. Once I get a hole, it's going to grow. And it's going to grow all the way to the point where, let's go back here. I know that, that if, if there's regions of my flow that are down here, I'm going to get a hole. But once I get a hole, I know that the flame is going to retreat all the way back to that point right there. And so the edges are going to retreat back. So what that means is, is that if I take a flame at time t equals 0, the hole is going to open. But it's going to open beyond the points where it's, and it's going to move all the way to these, these edge points right here. Um, and so, if you, actually, if you go back to Buckmuster's model problem, you can derive what the ratio of the, the value of the um, stretch rate at the edge is relative to its extinction value. And it's somewhere around a half, between a half and one. And so what that means is, once a flame hole opens, it's going to grow larger than would be expected based on continuous concepts. That's my main point. You send a vortex through a flame, the strain rate's too high, it makes a hole. That strain rate, that flame hole is going to grow bigger than you might think based upon the local stretch rate. You'd say, hey, the, the local stretch rate is lower than the extinction strain rate. I should be able to have a flame. But because you have an edge, that hole is going to grow bigger. And so actually, there's some really nice simulations that have been shown where people see this. So for example, this is, um, I think this is a calculation by uh, Hong Im and Jackie Chen, where you can clearly see extinction. And where these edges are don't correspond to the value of the stretch rate cap extinction. They're actually lower stretch rates. Now, I think edge, flame, edge flames is a, is a very, very uh, understudied problem. There's so many things that we don't know about them, but they're so important because any real situation has edge flames. And all we have, you know, Buckmaster's edge problem, it's a wonderful problem to understand the physics. But we need more calculations, more experiments out there. And I, for those of you who are looking for interesting research problems, or for those of you who are young faculty members looking for problems, I think this is a great problem to look at because it's a wide open space. Um, it's not, it's, some things are, there's a lot of people. It's, there's a, it's a little bit crowded. This, you won't, it's very uncrowded. Um, very, very uncrowded. And there's so many interesting things that, that we don't understand at all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up my discussion here of, of edge flames and just say, and, and so I hope, I, hope, I think the, the main points I wanted you to see is that, that um, continuous flame concepts can, 
miss really, really important physics about, and, uh, but, but it's, it's an area that's not well understood. There's a lot more work. It's, it's much, much uh, less mature than, than the things that I talked about with flame stretch. Does anyone have any questions before I move off of edge flames? Yes. Uh, n not, not necessarily. I mean, it's very common to see holes in, in real flames in high turbulence conditions. And so there's, there, you, you basically get a point of equilibrium where an edge speed and the tangential flow speed match each other. Okay, so that's, I've just had kind of a long-winded introduction. But really where I want to go to is trying to understand flame stabilization and shear layer. So let's, let's dig into that a little bit more. So, I think it seems pretty intuitive, you know, if we go, go to this picture here, for instance, that this flame, it's in a region of very, very high shear, and if the, if the stretch rate becomes too high, it's going to be bigger than cap extinction, the flame's going to extinguish. And, and data bears out this basic idea. For example, these are blow-off measurements where, we're, where basically what we did was we calculated the fuel air ratio at blow off, excuse me, we measured the fuel air ratio at blow off as a function of flow velocity. And then we converted, we did a detailed kinetic calculation to calculate what the corresponding extinction stretch rate of that mixture would be. And you know, this is typical data showing that one over cap extinction roughly goes as one on U. So you go to higher flow velocities, the flame extinguishes at, at lower equivalence ratios or, uh, excuse me, higher equivalence ratios or, or higher extinction stretch rates. So this is, this is kind of standard stuff, blow off boundaries. Um, but I want, I want to look into a little bit more here, is what is the actual stretch rate that a flame sees? Okay, we know that if the stretch rate exceeds cap extinction, if kappa is greater than cap extinction, we could expect to see extinction, and we know that the flame would blow off. And cap extinction is a reasonably well-defined quantity. You can calculate it. Um, but what's kappa? What is the flame seeing? So let's dig into that a little bit more. Um, so go, just going back to this, so in a high-speed flow, the reason that flames sit in shear layers is because the velocity is locally low in the shear layer, right? I mean, you, generally you're moving, you, you know, you might have a very high velocity flow, 50, 100, 300 meters per second. But within some very small region, the flow velocity goes to near zero, approaches zero in, in your boundary layer. But those are also points where the, where the um, shear is the highest, right? And so we have to kind of balance thinking about flow velocities with thinking about stretch rates. So the conditions where the flame can sit is limited by the amount of stretch before they can withstand extinction. Now, just to give you a feeling for some numbers, if you had a 50, millim 50 meter per second jet with a one millimeter shear layer thickness, then your fluid mechanic straining, okay, what I called S before, the, sh the fluid mechanic strain rate, that would be about 50,000 inverse seconds. So that's a big number. You know, if you look at all these numbers that I've shown you before, let's just flip back and just to get calibrated here. You know, these are extinction stretch rates of these methane hydrogen flames. You can see, you know, on the order of thousands. Um, let's see if I have some other results here. Where's the pressure? Oh, this 15 bar flame can withstand, you know, up to 75, up, up to about 70,000. The one atmosphere flame is extinguishing around 1,000. But anyway, at least for, but what this is telling you is, is that these fluid mechanic straining rates in, in, in typical high velocity flows can be really, really high. But that's fluid mechanic strain rate. The question that I want to address now is, what is the flame stretch rate? Remember, I emphasized this before, is we have to differentiate fluid mechanic straining and distortion of fluid elements from stretching a flame element. So how is flame stretch related to flow strain in a shear layer? Okay, so as we talked about, there's, there's a couple different sources of flame curvature, of, of flame stretch. You can have flame curvature, you can have unsteadiness, you can have hydrodynamic strain. What I really am going to be focusing on in this discussion is hydrodynamic strain, the, 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 um, the variations the strain that's induced by, by gradients in the flow velocity. And so basically you can write the, 
what I called kappa s in this way. So we'll, we'll, we'll assume that the flame is flat for now. All right. And here's, a, here's, here's my, my, um, the geometry that I want to look at. So here is, I have the flow going up. Flame is, is attaching at this point. It's spreading at some angle theta. Um, and then it's attaching at this point. And I want to figure out what is the flame, what is the actual stretch rate the flame is seeing. OK, now just for reference, the fluid strain rate, S, here I wrote it in tensor form. Remember, it's 1 half dui by dxj. This is a tensor. How is flame stretch related to flow strain? That's what I want to talk about. All right, well, so what I want to do is I want to dig into this expression for flame stretch a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that I have a two-dimensional problem, just for simplicity. And I'm going to assume that the flow upstream of the flame is incompressible. And so by assuming incompressible, what I can do is I can say that you know, dux by dx is equal to negative dui by dy. Um, and if I do that, I can write out this expression for the flame stretch. And basically, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the equations, but r the main thing I want to point out is there's two key contributions. Now remember, there's two ways that you get flow strain. You can, you can have normal strain. So if you take a fluid element like this, and if it's an incompressible flow, you can deform it like that. That's due to normal strain, right? Or, and so that's this term right here, duz by dz. So remember my coordinate system. So in other words, a variation in the z flow velocity, in the z component of the flow velocity in the z direction. Um, and by continuity, if the flow is if there's a gradient in this direction, that means there has to be a gradient in the flow velocity in the transverse direction, the, the transverse flow velocity in the transverse direction. And so, for example, if I had a flow that was accelerating in this direction, it would have to be squeezing in like that for continuity, and I would take my fluid element and do that. So this is normal strain. How does normal strain give me flame stretch? That's what I want to talk about now. Okay. Um, and the reason I want to do this is we've talked about these kind of canonical geometries, you know, these stagnation flows. And you might say, well, no real flow looks like that. So I want to, I want to look at a more interesting looking realistic flow where it's not a stagnation. So this is normal strain. The other way that I can strain it, if I took this fluid element and I could shear it, right? Sorry. Um, come over here. You have to be more assertive. OK, guys? Don't, don't be afraid to be assertive. I'm, I'm very forgetful. Um, so what I drew was, so you can have this fluid element, normal strain as it goes to that, shear strain, it goes to that. So how does this straining lead to flame stretch? Okay, but we can identify those two terms. This term is basically comes from normal strain. That's a normal straining term here. Um, and then it's multiplied by some stuff related to flame normals, which converts flow strain multiplied by that gives me flame stretch. Okay. Same way over here, this is shear strain, dux by dz times duz by dx. Um, so for example, let's look at this term, duz by dx. The velocity component in this direction, how much is it vary, how quickly does it vary in that direction? That's a shear term. Um, so again, this is flow strain multiplied by these flame quantities, nx, nz, nx. So this is the normal vector of the flame. Flow strain multiplied by that gives me flame stretch. So this is a, I like this formula because it's a nice way to relate fluid mechanic strain and flame stretch. But what you can see is that there's these two different, fundamentally different types of terms that, that give you flame stretch. So let's talk a little bit more. Why does shear give you stretch? Why does shear give you stretch? And the easiest way to do that is to draw a picture. So what I've done here is remember fundamentally what is flame stretch. Stretch is when the tangential, if you take the flow velocity, you decompose it into the tangential component. And if that's changing along the front, you know you got stretch, right? So I wish I was a little taller. Um, but if, this is, if these are three velocity vectors, in my, so I have a shear layer, right? So the velocity is increasing. So these are my three velocity vectors. And what I've done there is I've decomposed those velocity vectors into a normal and a tangential component. Does everybody follow? So is this a, is this a stretched flame? This is a stretched flame. Is it positive or negatively stretched? Oh, I, look at that. The answer's on the page. It's positively stretched. Yes. So it is a positively stretched flame. Now, now there's something that makes this problem very, very hard. And that is, in, in high velocity flows, 
the flame is almost vertical, right? Almost vertical because you got a 50 hundred meter per second flow. That flame is almost vertical. What if theta was, instead of being almost vertical, was vertical? What would the stretch rate be? It would be zero, right? The flame has to be at an angle with respect to the flow. If it was just standing up straight, there would be no variation in the tangential direction along the flame. Um, and so saying, you know what? That flame, theta is pretty close to zero. Let me just call it zero. Well, you just threw out, you threw it out. You got to, it's that theta small. So, and what you can also see is that, so, and that comes from basically if theta is small, for, in, in, in any real kind of flame, theta would be small. What that means is nz is small. So you're taking a potentially huge term here. This duz by dx can be big. We just did a calculation on the previous slide. So this is 50,000 inverse seconds multiplied by nz, which is small. So you're taking a small number, multiplying it by a big number, and say, oh, man, that's hard. Because you know my flame angle is at 1 degree with respect to vertical versus 2 degrees. I'm going to get a factor of 2 difference in the flame stretch. And if I'm trying to figure out if it's bigger than the extinction strain rate, this is what makes quantitative blowout calculations so tricky in, in high velocity flows. Um, but anyway, the bottom line is I hope what this showed you is when you have a shear, flame, the flame being oriented with respect to that shear layer gives you positive stretch. All right? OK. What about the other term, normal strain, the normal strain? OK? So what I've done here in order to illustrate that, I've drawn a flow that is decelerating. It doesn't have to be decelerating, but oftentimes in real combustor geometries, where the flame is stabilizing is where the flow, the flow is, is, is transitioning from a low to a high velocity region. You're going from a a low cross-sectional area to a bigger cross-sectional area. There, it's very typical. So again, it doesn't have to be that way, but I'm going to assume that my flow velocity, and, and I've turned, I, it, there's no shear here because I don't want to show, we just talked about shear, and I want to analyze these terms separately. So let's assume I have a high velocity flow and it's transitioning to a lower velocity flow. That's shown by these velocity vectors. Okay? And again, at the flame, what I've done is I've taken those velocity vectors and I've decomposed them into a component that's normal and tangential to the flame. So darn it, I gave you the answer again. But uh, this is a stretched flame, right? Can you see that, that those velocity, the tangential component of the velocity is changing along the front? In this case, this is a negatively stretched flame. This flame would be negatively stretched. Um, so jet flows typically decelerate, gives you normal strain, and that gives you negative stretch. So what that tells you is if you bring it all back home, come back here, this term is probably negative, a negatively stretched flame. This, this term is probably positive. So then you say, oh, no, I'm adding positive and negative numbers. And then life really gets hard, right? Because if you take um, negative 900 plus 1,000, well, that's 100. If you take negative 950 plus 1,000, that's 50. That's a factor of two change in the answer for a 10% change in your input. So you can start seeing things are going to be sensitive. Again, this is why predicting blowout is so hard, because it's really small changes can give you big, it, it's really hard to quantitatively predict flame stretch rates. Um, but let's try to do some scaling here and figure out and, and simplify things here a little bit. So for a high velocity flow, the flow velocity is going to be much greater than the flame speed. So theta, that spreading angle, is going to be small. So what that means is, for all intents and purposes, nx is basically 1 plus some quantity of order theta squared. Nz is basically a quantity of order theta plus order theta cubed. So let me just hang on to the leading order terms. Let me also assume that dux by dz, so any velocity component in the transverse direction, it's a variation in the axial direction, is small relative to the shear. Okay? So what that does then is kappa shear, which was negative nx nz, I'm going to approximate nx by 1. Nz, I'm going to write it as theta. I'm going to ignore this term. So this whole thing simplifies to theta times duz by dx. This term right here simplifies the nx becomes 1. This becomes order theta squared. I'll ne neglect this term relative to that one. And I just get duz by dz. So what we have here is a relationship between 
flow strain, specifically flow shearing strain and flame stretch. And you can see that they're related by the flame angle. They're not the same. I talked about that before. And in particular, they're very different. If theta is a really small number, flame stretch and flow strain are very different, at least due to shear. In contrast, normal strain, they're basically the same. Fluid normal straining leads to roughly the same amount of flame stretching. Shear straining leads to much, much smaller amounts of flame stretching in high velocity flows. Again, that, that's contingent on, on that angle theta being small. OK, and so then we're, the overall flame stretch is the sum of these two quantities. And so again, I just want to emphasize these two quantities have opposite signs. That always spells trouble when you're adding two big numbers of opposite signs. Errors can blow up, or uncertainties blow up. This term is a, is a product of a big number times a small number. Again, so it, this just tells you that, that figuring out what flame stretch rates are going to be difficult. But let's try to scale them. OK, so what's theta? Well, if theta is, if we just take, if we assume that theta is roughly proportional to a flame speed divided by an axial flow velocity, which basically just flame kinematics, then this kappa shear term is basically going to go as flame speed times duz by dx normalized by uz. And if we want to scale this thing, the normalized velocity gradient is basically going to scale as 1 over a shear layer thickness. All right, so delta shear would be the thickness of the velocity shear layer. So what that says is, notice that the flame stretch rate is proportional to the ratio of the flame speed divided by the velocity shear layer thickness. So one thing that's interesting about this is that what this suggests is that the stretch rate, at least explicitly, is independent of flow velocity. Now that's interesting because we, all, we, we generally scale stretch rates as flow velocities divided by a length scale. Flow velocity doesn't even explicitly show up here. The only way the flow velocity actually shows up is in the shear layer thickness. In general, shear layers scale as 1 over Reynolds number to the half or something like that. So there is a velocity sensitivity here. But it's actually a square root of velocity sensitivity, not a linear velocity sensitivity. And so for any of you who do blowout work, this is just, it should sort of send off a, a little bit of an alarm bell because, again, we oftentimes scale stretch rates or, or, or flow times as scaling with velocities divided by length scales. And this suggests that at least the shearing part doesn't have that scaling. It's, a, it's more of a square root of velocity. Um, the, str the normal strain. Do you do you z by dz? Well, that 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 follows a much more traditional flow scaling approach. We can scale that as the axial flow velocity divided by some characteristic length scale, and this is kind of the traditional um, flow time scaling approach that you would get. But again, the overall flame stretch is the sum of these two terms. Um, whoops. And and so, like I said, the the overall stretch is the sum of those two terms. They're opposite sign more than likely. So which term dominates, it's not immediately clear. Um, just to show you, this is some data from the literature of <coughs> showing flame stretch rates right at near the flame attachment point. So these are normalized strain rates. They're basically strain rate divided by 44,000 inverse seconds as a function of distance downstream. So it's the first 20 millimeters. These are those. The, it's kind of a complicated plot. These different symbols denote the different contributing terms. So if you back up um, you know, to this expression, there's four contributing terms. We've plotted all four of them here. But the dominant term is this one, which is positive. That is this nx, nz, duz by dx. That's the shear term. OK, so the shearing gives you this positive value of flame stretch, which varies between, say, you know, 1,000 and 4,000 inverse seconds. The other big term is this one right here. That is the normal strain term. You can see that's on the order, that's negative. The overall stretch is the circles with the error bars. And again, you can see you're adding a big positive number to a big negative number. And the answer comes out, and again, that's an error amplifier. But what this data suggests is, is that about the first 10 millimeters of the flame is actually negatively stretched um, with values of around 1,000 inverse seconds, negative 1,000 inverse seconds. And then as you move farther downstream, the flame becomes positively stretched. 
Um, and so then what you, you would do is you could compare these, these stretch rates to flame stretch rates to extinction values to figure out whether the flame could actually survive under those conditions. Does anyone have a question? Hope this gives you a, a little bit of appreciation, you know, that the whole flame stabilization problem, very, very interesting interconnections between fluid mechanics and, uh, and kinetics. Now, I think just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over these next two slides, and I want to jump down here. And I specifically want to talk a little bit about bluff body stabilized flames and, and blow off, and talk a little bit more, more what's happening physically. Now, it's known that, that flames, in general, what happens when you start to get close to blow off, it's not that the flame is there, you decrease the, and everything's happy and healthy, and then you decrease the equivalence ratio, or you increase the velocity a little bit, and then the flame's gone. Usually what happens is, is that the flame starts to get really unsteady. It starts to flap around all crazy. It starts to get holes in it. Things start happening. You know, these are just some, some images of a, a a flame near blowout, you know, different sequences of time. You can see this hole that opens up in the flame. You can see it convecting downstream. See it healing itself. These are some other images. These are luminosity images. You can see um, extinction downstream and, and so forth. And so generally, what we've uh, suggested is that there's really three stages to blow off. The first stage is where the flame is, um, you basically, the, 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 the the flow and the flame basically look like they do under healthy conditions, but what happens is you, you start to get these local extinction events. Every now and then you get a hole in the flame, and you'll see it here. And as you move closer to blow off, these happen more often. So you can calculate, you know, you can measure or, or calculate um, average number of extinction events per unit time, and you'd see that it would start to monotonically rise as you start getting closer to blow off. And then at some point you move into what we call the second stage, which is where you got so much extinction that you're actually starting to have large-scale changes in what the flow is doing. So um, you might, you know, you might have a if it's a bluff body stabilized flame or a backward-facing step stabilized flame. You might all of a sudden the flame would just be be ex very very unsteady. You might see the onset of vortex shedding, whereas you hadn't seen it before. But but the whole idea is is your 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 basic the 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 the, de the degree of disruption of the flow in the flame is so severe that it's just a completely different animal. And then the whole thing blows off. Um, now a very standard approach for capturing, for scaling blowout limits, I call it the dom Cohen number scaling, but let me just be a little bit more general. Um, a, very, a very typical way for scaling blow off boundaries is by, would be, you know, scaling data with something like this, kappa extinction over kappa, where you, you, you'd have some kinetic um, extinction stretch rate normalized by some estimated flow sh flow sh um, flame stretch rate. And I, I just spent the last 20 minutes talking about how to scale this flame stretch rate. But <coughs> it's known that you can do a pretty good job of scaling blow off data with this. Or sometimes people you know, put it in terms of a dom Kohler number, which would be you know, some fluid mechanic time scale over some chemical time scale where you'd approximate the flow time scale by some reference length scale divided by some reference velocity scale divided by some reference chemical time. Um, and so a pretty typical approach for scaling blow off, and these approaches actually work pretty well. Um, but what we what we've postulated is, is that these scalings aren't really actually capturing the processes which are leading to blow off. What they're really doing is they're describing stage one. Um, what they're telling you is, is that, that local extinction on the flame can be correlated with some local dom Kohler number, some Karlovitz number, whatever. Um, but the reason that they work to actually predict blow off is because there's this chain, and um, there's, this, there's this fundamental link between the onset of, of, of local extinction and the ultimate blow-off event on the flame. So in other words, these dom Kohler or Karlowitz number scalings are not, don't scale blow-off physics. They scale stage one physics. And because stage one 
a blow off is, is correlated to blow off, that's why they work. I don't know if that made any sense at quarter to five on Thursday, but uh, just wanted to make that point, which is that uh, um, th this, this, this actually continues to be a very active uh, area of work, uh, which uh, again, we have Professor Choudhury here from I, uh, Indian Institute of Sciences in Bangalore who, uh, who's done quite a, made lots of nice contributions to this area. But, but, but the bottom line is, is that we, at this point, at to, as of today, we really don't have a capability or an understanding of what, is, what causes flames to actually go away, to blow off. What we understand is what causes flames to start getting extinction on them, which we know is a necessary precursor to blow off. I'm not sure if that, if that distinction is clear. Does anyone have any questions about that? OK. Main thing is blow off is a, is a, is a, is a phenomenon that, ca that is very complex coupling of fluid mechanics and, um, and uh, kinetics. So that's, that's all I'm going to say about flame stabilization in shear layers. So you have flames, they're parked themselves in low velocity, but very high shear, high strain regions of the flow. Um, now I just want to say a couple things about flame stabilization in stagnation points. So there's a, another way to stabilize a flame is to have what's called an aerodynamically stabilized flame. And so let's go back to some images that I showed you, or, or, or at least that are similar to images that I showed you before. This, this or this flame shapes, um, the center part of the flame, these would be examples of aerodynamically stabilized flames. So these are flames where presumably the flame speed is balancing the approach flow velocity. And what you do is you set up the fluid mechanics of the flow such that you create a low velocity region in the interior of the flow, as opposed to shear layer stabilized flames where it's that separating boundary layer that gives you the low velocity region. But that necessarily puts you in a region of high shear. In aerodynamically stabilized flame, you'd try to use some other fluid mechanic means to create a stagnation region here. Very common approach, as we talked about yesterday, is to swirl the flow. When you swirl the flow, you get vortex breakdown, gives you a stagnation point, gives you flames that look like this or like this. So these are some OH plif images of, uh, of flames. These are actually flames which are kind of hybrid. The, the flame stabilizes in the outer shear layer. So this would be a shear layer stabilized flame. It spreads, but then it actually wraps around. And then this part of the flame attaches <coughs> or doesn't attach. It's stabilized by this stagnation point. So you get this kind of flame shape. These are two, two different images of this same situation. Now, one difference between the shear layer stabilized part of the flame and the, and the aerodynamically stabilized part is this shear layer stabilized flame stays pretty fixed. It's not moving around much. It stays pretty locked down unless you're close to blow off. This part of the flame is actually bouncing around quite a bit because while there might be a time average stagnation point, instantaneously that stagnation point is moving all around the flow. It might be precessing. It might be spinning around. So the whole leading edge of the flame would be precessing off center. We see that a lot. Um, now, in contrast, these flames over here, these are shear layer stabilized flames. So it's stabilized both in this inner shear layer of this annulus and this outer shear layer. Um, these are some other images. Now, this is also not, not a very well understood problem because th this slide actually just summarizes a bunch of the stuff that I just said. So let me just run through this. So the flame stabilizes in front of the stagnation point. This is a series of OH plif shots just showing you how unsteady that aerodynamically stabilized flame is. Notice how it's bouncing all over the place. Um, and that stagnation point's moving up and down. It's precessing. It's highly unsteady in contrast to the flame which is sitting at the edge. But the question that I want to think about here is under what circumstances can you actually have aerodynamically stabilized flames? Because they're not always observed. Sometimes flames just blow off without finding an interior stagnation point. Um, flames can blow off without reverting to this flea free floating configuration. And, and, and so I think you can see intuitively that in order to have an aerodynamically stabilized flame, you, you're going to have to have an interior stagnation point. You've got to have a low velocity region interior to the flow. And so in order to dig into this a little bit more, we need to, let me just talk through this here. Um, you have to, um, 
Let me, let me talk a little bit more about vortex breakdown in annular geometries. A very common geometry that I, sh I, sh I mentioned it to you before, but let me just draw it for you again, is when you have swirl flows, this would be a typical nozzle type situation. A very common type of geometry would be to have some sort of center body. This would, this would denote something which imparts swirl to the flow. Without the center body, the, the reason that you usually put the center body in there is that without the center body, it's really, really hard to not have a really strong wake and to have the flame flash back. It's hard to, to not, that combustion-induced vortex breakdown mechanism I talked about yesterday, it's really hard to fight that mechanism off without, a, without that because you have this low pressure region in the middle. Um, you can do it, but more often than not, you have a, a uh, a flow like this where you have this annulus. And so what you basically do is you have this swirling flow, but you also have this strong wake, this strong axisymmetric wake. And the interaction of the swirl flow with that wake gives you some interesting stuff here. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to show here in these slides, that as we increase swirl number or as we increase center body diameter, generally what happens is, is that for a very weak swirl, what you'll get is, is that the effect of swirl basically takes that wake and it just makes it a lot longer. Okay? Um, if you, uh, but once you move, but once you move above vortex breakdown, what can oftentimes happen is, is you'll get a, a, a wake from the, a wake region from the, um, center body, and then you'll get this vortex breakdown region here. And there's your stagnation point. But if the swirl number becomes too high, what will oftentimes happen is, is that the vortex breakdown in this, in this wake will merge into a single structure. And if that happens, the only place you have a stagnation point is right there. So the, um, this is where fluid mechanics of swirling flows really, really matters for flame stabilization. Because it turns out that whether or not you get an aerodynamically stabilized flame is a very strong function of the degree of interaction of the vortex breakdown bubble with the, uh, the wake of this center body. If you don't have a center body, aerodynamically stabilized flames are easy. They almost, you almost always get them because you don't have this issue, but you, you do have the flashback concern. But once you have the center body, it turns out that oftentimes you don't get an interior stagnation point, and so therefore you only get shear layer stabilized flames. It's, it turns out it's actually tricky to get aerodynamically stabilized flames because of that interaction. And that's what I've tried to draw on this slide here, where, for, where you would have two separate structures, the wake, the vortex breakdown bubble. There's a nice interior stagnation point. You'll have a, a flame sitting there, whereas here they're merged and you simply can't get an um, interior stagnation point. So what would happen would be, let's suppose that you are moving towards blowout. And, and in both of these, let's suppose that initially you had a flame stabilized in this inner shear layer. All right? If this inner shear layer, if the shear sh rate got too strong and the flame locally blew off of this inner shear layer, that doesn't mean it would completely go away. Because what would happen is it just move downstream and catch itself at this stagnation point. Whereas in this geometry, if you lost the flame in this inner shear layer, there's nowhere else for it to sit, and it's gone. Um, and so that's probably, here, here are two different OH plif images where this is probably what's happening um, in terms of, you know, here you only have a, you have a shear layer stabilized flame, no aerodynamically stabilized flame. Here you have an aerodynamically stabilized flame, and presumably that's because of these differences in the wakes. One last point I want to make, it's 458, um, is, is that, again, when we talk about aerodynamically stabilized flames, we're almost always introducing swirl flow concepts. Last thing I want to make, how many of you work with swirl flows? Okay. Don't forget your downstream boundary condition is my parting words to you. Swirl flows are very sensitive to downstream boundary conditions. You know, I run experiments all the time and I get a little sloppy with my boundary conditions. I work with some of my colleagues who do CFD and they knock me around and make me get right about it and they, to worry about boundary conditions. But, you know, 
oftentimes, at the end of the day, you run your experiment. You know, you might run an open flame out in the lab, or you might confine it. You don't really worry about degree of contraction what's, or downstream or something like that. Turns out swirl flows are very, very sensitive to what's happening downstream. So a, a simple example would be, let me just draw you two, two situations here. Let's suppose I have a flow with no swirl, okay? So similar geometry, let me just make it the same. So pretty typical kind of geometry. Again, you have this center body. If there's no swirl, the flame would basically, you know, spread to the walls, look something like that. And in order to confine it, you might slap a quartz tube over your combustor. How many of you do this stuff? You know what I'm talking about. You just take a quartz tube, bang, you drop it over, it might be open to the environment. And you don't think about it twice. And you'd say, do I get a different, you know, as long as this tube is longer than the flame, you know, it could be this long or it could be this long. Or maybe I might, you know, put a little bit of a contraction on it. Don't expect my answer to change much. As soon as you start getting above breakdown, if, if you start swirling this flow, I can tell you that the structure of the swirl flow is going to be very, very sensitive to what happens downstream. You can get completely different flame shapes as you, if you, for example, vary the degree of exit contraction. Wouldn't happen. If it wasn't swirling, it couldn't care less. It would have a very, very, very little impact. But swirl flows are very, very sensitive to that. And um, I don't want to get into the technical reasons for this, but basically, once you rotate, once you have fluid rotation, you get different wave propagation mechanisms. Um, and your exit boundary condition can really, really change your vortex breakdown bubble topology. So that's just my, just the one thing I just want to emphasize to all of you is downstream boundary conditions matter. You can get very, very different flame shapes. And, and just, to, just to illustrate that, let me just jump back to a slide that I showed you before. To, to, when I was trying to motivate all this stuff, I talked about, if you remember I showed you the you have these different families of flame shapes. And in this particular case, we go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 as we increase equivalence ratio. Well, it turns out that that configuration 2 and 3, whether or not you even get that configuration 2, totally depends upon what your downstream contraction ratio is. As, as we, we actually did these experiments where we, as you increase contraction ratio, you just jump straight from 1 to 2. You don't even get configuration, excuse me, 1 to 3. You don't even get configuration 2. But it's one of these phenomena that, that swirl flows are particularly sensitive to your, to your downstream boundary conditions, even in very, very subsonic, even in, you know, very subsonic flows. OK, does anyone have any questions? All right, so what we're going to do here is um, shoot, um, just, just so you can all reflect this evening on tomorrow, reflect and prepare profitably. We've talked about flashback. We've talked about blow off. And, and, and from both of those, we reverted. We looked at some more fundamental stuff. We talked about flame aerodynamics. We talked about stretch, edge flames. Tomorrow, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about time harmonic phenomenon, largely. All right? We're going to start by talking about disturbance, propagation, and reacting flows. And we're going to talk about how flames respond to harmonic excitation. So we're going to move away from transient problems, extinction, things like that, and start thinking about time harmonic combustion problems. All right, so have a good evening. Thank you all.